Hi, this is Dr. Mark Kukazawa, coming back to you from uh, Shepherdstown, West Virginia. It was a great pleasure to be on ADAPT Live a few months ago, talking about some of the initiatives we're doing here in our community, in our hospital. And today we're going to focus mostly on how to start a sugar-free hospital. Um, some of y'all are healthcare workers out there, others just concerned citizens, and I think you can get involved in your own local healthcare system. Um, so we'll just have, kind of talk briefly about that. You know, so a little background on where I work and where I live. So I'm in a state called West Virginia, which is the number one state for obesity and diabetes in the United States. We have about a 15 to 16 percent rate of diabetes in adults, and that's just what's detected. And our obesity rate now is is hovering near 40 percent. So those aren't good stats. They've both tripled since about 1975. So those rates have tripled and they're not showing any sign of decline despite an occasional article you might see out there that obesity is is stabilizing. It's really not. You know, you might see a short-term report, but then when you look at the long-term data and certainly the most recent CDC data is this uh, diabetes and obesity are not going away and they are still undefeated. You know, and I believe as a healthcare system, it's got to start with us. You know, if we're expecting schools to change, you know, vending machines and public places to change, you know, if we're not willing to change our hospital, you know, how, how can we go out public and talk about this stuff? Um, a little about how our hospital started low carbohydrate and embracing it. So um, I'm a physician, I'm a family physician, do mostly hospital work now as well as clinical work with uh, remission of diabetes. So that's our goal is to not manage and treat diabetes, but put it into remission. So about six years ago, we started in, in my hospital with nursing education that yes, you can reduce carbohydrates for diabetics on their hospital trays, and you don't need to give them sliding scale insulin. Uh, you know, the standard ADA hospital meal is about 60 grams carb per meal, uh, including snacks in between of about 15 gram carbs. And many of you out there know what that would do to you if you're a diabetic, we would need to cover you with a lot of insulin. That's called a sliding scale. So the science was starting to, to come out then that, okay, there is another way, you know, we had Dr. Westman's work, you know, that he was doing low carbohydrates and certainly historical work of diabetes showed that the proper diet for a diabetic was not carbohydrates. And then, you know, the whole saturated fat fear and fat fear and food pyramid came in. So we lost a lot of our knowledge from back in the 1950s and 60s. So we started doing 10 gram carb uh, per meals and these needed to be free texted in because they didn't come up on the electronic record because it wasn't a standard diet. But our kitchen embraced that, they learned how to cook. Um, they were making wonderful meals. You know, I'd go down to the kitchen and you know, give them you know, good kudos when they did great. You know, if there's something for improvement, if they didn't understand that fruit juice was carbs, you know, I'd go down and uh, talk to them about that. So it was a really fun relationship. And, uh, and that grew and, and we started to see nurses embracing this. You know, we have several nurses in our hospital, you know, that have lost 100 plus pounds. Um, nurses taking this home to staff members, I mean, to family members and, and other staff in the hospital. You know, we're doing this and putting diabetes in remission, you know, A1C is going down, medications going down. Um, this started to get a little more public. We started to have community groups in West Virginia teaching this at a larger scale in the community. Um, the hospital really started to embrace this, which the residents were teaching it, medical students learning it, and it was fun, you know, to, to admit a patient who was on 200, 400 units of insulin and show them that if we don't feed them the same stuff, they can uh, not take the medicines. And they're like, wow, no one told me that. And, and they can, you know, leave the hospital on maybe 20 or 40 units and then have a gradual plan to taper off. This led to us opening a clinic just this year it's called the uh, West Virginia University Center for uh, Metabolic Health and Diabetes. So I'm allowed within West Virginia University now to educate on well-formulated ketogenic and low-carbohydrate diets. So, you know, we're trying to teach people how to do this well. Um, there's still a fear in the medical community that, oh, this is dangerous, this is extreme. Um, you know, no one can sustain that, but, but that's not true. Um, I just published a paper with colleagues, about 1,500 patients around the world. The majority of them had been on this over a year and 30% had been on it two years. And the diabetes numbers were just fascinating, just seeing diabetes go away as well as medication. So that's 1,500 people who have sustained it. So maybe that's 1,500 anecdotes. So this led to you know a friendly conversation with my hospital administration probably about a year ago. 
you know, let's try to like make some larger change in the hospital and kind of be a, a candle in the darkness, so to speak, you know, within our state. I'm a 24 bed hospital. And sometimes it's easier to move a small rock than a big rock. You know, if I went to a 500 bed hospital and tried to get rid of all the sugar drinks, that might not happen. And unless I really had a lot of rapport or I own the place, it, it probably wouldn't happen. So we started, uh, you know, some committee meetings, you know, with our lead nurses, uh, pharmacist, our dietitian, our dean, who really embraced this. Dr. Emma Eggleston is a endocrinologist. And uh, yeah, she was all on board. Uh, you know, our CFO, CEOs, they were all on board. So we started to make a strategic plan. And the street strategic plan was to push this out as a very positive thing, not that we're taking people's rights away, you know, make people proud that they are the change and they're a spark in the change. So we started to draft some documents and there's one healthcare system that I have a lot of thanks to is Geisinger Health in Pennsylvania. So it took them 10 years to get this initiative, a sugar-free beverage initiative through their hospital. And they shared some really great resources and experiences with me of trying to get that into their health system. And they went whole system wide. You know, I think they've got like, you know, 400 clinics and six hospitals. So they went all in January 1st. So they kind of set the, and, and they didn't really have any negative feedback from this. So it was good to hear that even in a large system, no negative feedback, maybe a little bit here and there, but in essence, it's, it's going. So we drafted some press releases, uh, education materials, you know, how we're going to share this out over email to all the staff prior, you know, so you're part of the change, educating them on what sugar drinks are doing to the body, explain to them why we're doing this. And so what actually we're, we're doing at West Virginia University Jefferson Medical Center. So we've removed sugar sweetened beverages from pretty much all aspects of the hospital. This includes patient trays. So used to be you could just order, you know, sodas or, you know, sweet drinks, large juices. You know, for whatever reason, that's just part of the tray. Even diabetic trays would show up with Cokes. And, and there would always be tons of sodas just laying around the floor, Gatorade, which staff would, you know, be drinking and using, you know, just for their own needs. So we got rid of those. Um, we also got rid of the vending machines down near the ER in the cafeteria. The vending machines, you know, all used to cover or carry all the sugar sweetened drinks. So we got rid of that. We got rid of all the fountain drinks. So for visitors, there's no sugar sweetened beverages available for the visitors. Um, so we co co covered everything, patients, uh, staff, and visitors. Now there are some unique medical needs, whereas my dog scratching back there. You know, so if a patient is post-surgical, um, gut starting to recover and wants some sips of a sugar drink just to get some calorie in them, so sure, that's fine. You have a child recovering from appendicitis, that's fine. You know, so there are unique indications that we are gonna use some sugar drinks if the patient wants it, if it's gonna be for their medical condition or just for their mood, a child. You know, there's non-diabetics, there's no reason they can't have these small, uh, very small juices like your grandma used to serve. So everything's case by case. And, and certainly staff, I haven't seen anyone bring any in, but this, they're allowed to bring in their own sugar drink. So if they feel like they can't make it through, you know, an eight hour shift, you know, 12 hour shift without a sugar drink, sure, they can bring their own in and, you know, put it in the refrigerator. Um, gosh, about 20 years ago, it was, you know, you used to be able to smoke in hospitals and there were smoking areas in the hospital. And then the smoking areas went outside the hospital with those little uh, butt things and, and uh, you know, you be like just put the button in the, in the little tube and now you have to go off campus so I'm hoping over the next 10 or 20 years this won't be so crazy a thought that you get rid of sugar drinks you know so now you can't bring them in you know you, you can't drink them in in the cafeteria but you know maybe other places will, will pick that up so it's been about gosh about a month since we started this and it's, it's been great you know I, I've a couple the most of the questions are why aren't we eliminating you know, the artificially sweetened drinks, you know, so that's actually a good question to, to have that people are like, let's do more, but you know, you have to do incremental change. So to take everything away, you know, we want to make this positive and make people feel really good about what they're doing and, and be the change. And we don't want to make people angry or we're taking their rights away. So ultimately, you know, I think, you know, you know, diet sodas might go away, but right now it's getting rid of all the sugar drinks is our first priority. 
And, and we also, there's unique issues with this too when you're working with an institution like a hospital because there's contracts with vendors. You know, we're required to have these certain products. So we had to make some unique negotiations with our vendor, which was Coke. And they were, they were willing to work with us. You know, our local vendor for Coke came, he showed us all these products that didn't have sugar, these new products. So not that I'm a, a fan of, of Coke vendors, but you know, you got to deal with what you have. And I couldn't get rid of Coke as, as a vendor of our hospital. It's a contract. So they worked really well with us to get mostly the waters in there and a few. There's some new products that are using not the aspartame type of sweeteners. They're some more the stevia sweeteners. So it's incremental change and Coke was willing to work with us and even my hospital administration agreed. So there was a little bit of fear. Gosh, we're going to lose revenue. And then we all kind of looked at each other and said, well, you know, that is kind of silly to think that you know, a hospital creating revenue off of sugar drinks is, is something that is a goal, but you know, it is real, you know, I, I mean, hospitals, we operate, we're a critical access hospital, so we're, we operate on a razor thin margin. So we got a clause in our legal contract to say, okay, if we do lose revenue from this, you know, we're not gonna shut it down. So, but I, I believe it'll probably end up being revenue neutral, you know, going forward. Um, I just, here's a couple little things just for education. So this is a, a little card it's a little tent you know so we put this up on every table so you know patients visitors see this you know these are on the tents you know at every table in the dining hall we've got these wonderful little posters this is a small version you know it's a sugar 101 so it kind of goes through and it educates how much sugar is in the drinks how much sugar is in your bloodstream you know we have another poster and these are large posters it's called Q&A you know and then maybe we could share these on the Facebook page but these are posted big and large, so we're trying to answer the objections up front and uh, get people to to feel proud about it. There's been some really good local press on this, you know, from our papers, uh, from local television stations, um, you know, so we're expressing joy with this. Uh, next steps, you know, so people, you know, these are the great emails to get. So gosh, what are you gonna do next? You know, whether in our hospital or in the larger system, so I work for West Virginia University. So we're like a, a small, you know, satellite around the big mothership, so to speak. So our main hospital in Morgantown probably has, gosh, five or 600 beds, you know, 40 outpatient clinics, you know, massive, kind of like Geisinger, huge institution. And we also have a larger hospital within our local region called Berkeley Medical Center. So we're, you know, we're test running this here, you know, get feedback, uh, see how people are doing. Um, and then go to the next hospital. So our, our next step would be our hospital, Berkeley Medical Center, which is about a 100, 150 bed hospital, you know, go into there and then go into the larger main campus hospital in Morgantown, which is the large tertiary care referral center. We have support from our Dean, Clay Marsh. So Clay actually is a colleague and, and friend of Gary Taubes. Clay is our, our main campus Dean and, and we actually brought Gary with Clay's blessing to West Virginia last year for a continuing medical education event. So we introduced our state to, you know, to the science um, of Gary Taubes. You know, it's incredible what, what he's done over the last 20 years. So that's really all I got for you here today. <laughs> you know, so my plea to you is uh, try to change your local workplace with these initiatives. Anyone can reach out to me. My email is afrundock at gmail.com that's af like air force r-u-n-d-o-c at gmail i'll share all my materials with you you know whether you're working you know at a law firm or a hospital you know be the change and and get rid of the sugar drinks do it in your house too you know we don't have any sugar drinks in my home my kids aren't low carb they're teenagers and you know running two hours a day so they'll eat some carbs but we just don't have sugar drinks in the house so so start local um Go into your schools, that's the next step too. You know, I'd really like to get this into the schools. Kids eat more sugar at breakfast for the free school lunches than the WHO recommends for an entire day for a child. So that's gotta stop. But uh, yeah, reach out and uh, thank you, Glenn and Adapt Live for letting me chat this morning. It's a wonderful sunny day here. Get outside, get some exercise and uh, have a great day.